Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody. This is Alex and Alex. Now, you guys are not getting it yet, but you're going to get it. I'm Alexander O'Neill. This is Alexander Johnson. And we are now a team. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the track that you're going to be hearing today, we're going to be playing... Uh, Criticize? Criticize, and... Uh, and we'll be going through that and kind of giving you guys a little play-by-play -play on how we recorded and how we got to the place where it became a song. Because a lot of times, you know, you hear a track, a track is a track, but it's not a record yet. So we're going to try to give you guys a little more insight on how to get to a record, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're in the control room now, um, pulled up Criticize 3.0, and we're we'll starting with the kick drum, talk you through the drums. So this is an amalgamation of mainly a live kit of about 12 microphones, and a couple of uh, stock sounds that I have that I've collected over the years that we build in and blend in to make a bit of drum replacement, which I'll show you in a sec. So we'll start with the first kick, which is just outside the kick drum, just about an inch outside, just in the hole, and there's not a great deal going on because I want the natural sound to poke through. So we've got an SSL channel on there, which has got a little bit of an expander just poking through. Uh, no compression on that. I just wanted that to, like, to, be, to be live and have a bit of punch. Uh, we've dropped about 350 out there, which you can tell, which is frequencies we don't really use, which is why we get rid of those. Uh, it's a good one for toms and for overheads, and it creates a lot more space within the mix if you can get rid of this 250 to 450 kind of frequencies, and even up to 650. If you can play with those on a kit, you generally find you have a bit more space with the mix in the end. So bass, that's what on there. We've got the R bass, which is a fantastic plug-in for just bringing up your basses and your kick drums. Um, again, you get a sense of the difference between it. So very subtle, because it can be quite powerful. So it's just nice and subtle to taste again with here. So if I turn it off, you can hear where it's a little flatter and it's just a little warmer and a bit more punch and it just sits in the mix a bit better. So once I've done that, I'll then, we'll then compress it. So it's very, very, very gentle, a 6-1 ratio. Just touching it, just kissing it, nothing too, nothing too drastic. Uh, a faster release because I want the compressor to hit it, but because it's a kick drum and there's space between, I can play with the release time so it's not attacking it straight away or it's not releasing it straight away. There's a bit of variant with the kick drum, slightly different with other instruments where it's moving faster and you need more control, but with the kick drum you've got a bit of space to work with. So it's very subtle, it's not getting rid of the natural element of it at all. And then something that I use as a little trick of mine, which is the BT compressor, which is a copy of one of the classic compressors. And that's just for a little bit of volume and a little bit of a valve uh, amp, really. That's all that does, just to give it a little bit of dirt and a, and a bit more added warmth. So then we have the kick out, which is about, again, depending on what you're doing, it's about a foot from outside the kick drum. Again, it all depends on size. This wanted to be a live sound with the kick. Uh, with the kit. The whole song is basically... Uh, I tried to do it as if you were looking down from a booth at an orchestra, uh, the old film score way, so if you, the John Barry sound for the Bond soundtrack, the whole band were behind and the kit is a little bit more distant than you would normally have it it's in certain music, the snare's very in your face, kit's very in your face, but I wanted depth with this. So this is a little bit more, a little bit more depth and a little bit more control. So this is the kick out, same kind of thing going on with that as we did. It's a little bit brighter. Um, so this is a bit more punch to this one, so there's not much as much bottom end going on. Again, there's that frequency again, the 250 that we're losing. A little bit of the R bass is doing the same job. More subtle though. Just bringing out just the fatness there again. So the two together, you can feel the power, but you can also feel the snap from the kick. You can feel the expander just poking it through a little bit more. So that's just one kick. There comes the out kit, and we've got a little bit more liveness to it, a little bit more sort of feel, which is what we want. So same again, just a little bit of compression, 6-1 ratio, I would imagine again. Yeah, again, you can see it touching a little bit more probably with that because I also like to use 
um, the room sound as well. So I don't gate as much with drums when I'm doing the live stuff because I like the bleed from other microphones in. If you're doing pop music and you're tight and you're clean, you're going to want to gate things, you're going to want to separate stuff, you're going to want to, you know, spaces in. With this, I didn't because the warmth of the snare drum from the kick creates the more room sound and a more natural feel. So that's a little trick to use. Don't over gate drums if you want a live sound. So just to add to that, I have two plugins that uh, two kick drums that I use quite a lot. One of them I call Groove or Grov, as it says there, uh, which again is more of a dance kind of kick. It has more dance elements to it. So you've got power in there. You can hear you've got thump to it, and I don't do very much to that at all because it's a plugin I use. So it's the same thing again. The SSL on there, no expansion on that at all. Just a little bit of 2K poking out just to give it a little bit more. You can hear there, drop it out, it loses all its energy completely. If I bring it in, it's got miles more energy and it's a bit liver sounding. So lose the EQ, more dance, bring the EQ in, slightly liver. So you can play with that. I, I use this on, on dance records, on live records, hip hop records, everything. So that's one of those that I use. So it's a little clever trick with the EQ. Same again, dropped a bit 250 out there. This the that muddy frequency which we don't we don't use, so I'll lose it. I'm of the opinion, like a lot of other producers, cutting is better than, um, than boosting. I learned that very quickly, uh, which is a good thing. So my favourite one of all, which is the little one I use, is a tra uh, Jurassic 5 kick drum uh, from a track called What's Golden, which is something that I use. And this is just my top end and just, uh, again, a little bit more of attack and a little bit more punch. Same kind of thing, just the SSL touching it, just to give it the warmth. There's a little bit more compression going on. On this one you can see there I've got about three decibels that I'm dropping down there high pass filter um, going on there as well so you can see everything up probably just under 20 out don't take too much out uh, and then nothing really going on there so it's just the expander again just to poke it and the compressor just to bring it down and that just sits between the four that just sits between all four of them so you can feel with the groove in it's a very, very different sound. That creates a lot more punch. So you can hear in the background, like I mentioned a minute ago, you can hear the snare playing, the hi-hat playing. Sometimes that's a good sound, you know? In the old days, they did four microphones, two microphones, one microphone, so you kind of play with it. So that's all four of the kick drums together, so that's those done. Okay, so then move on to the live snare, which is the top snare. So I generally do bottom and top, but very rarely use the bottom. Uh, unless I'm doing something specific with the sound. So we'll just take you through the snare drum. Which is a Black Beauty, just for the record. A Ludwig Black Beauty. And again on this, we've really got the SSL again, which is taking a little bit up to about 60 hertz off. I'm just rolling that off. A touch of 3K, which is just for the attack of the snare drum. Uh, I'm not rolling anything off the bo bottom end else because I'm doing that at the top there. So there's no compression on that at the moment. Uh, no expansion or anything, it's just a live, natural feel from the room again, just for the sound. So that's that. Tiny bit of EQ. Something that I've learned for warmth of snare drum, about 400, uh, sorry, about 4 at 100, so 4 decibels at about 100, is generally a really nice whack to the snare drum. If you're doing, again, dance music and things like that, not so much, but with this, I was going for the old 70s drum sound, and that really helps to just anchor him, make the cohesion of the snare drum a lot more powerful at the bottom. Uh, again, just a tiny touch of 10K at the top, just to bring out the brightness of it, which the bottom snare helps with as well, but I just like a little bit of 10K. It just seems to bring out a bit of spark in the snare drum and that tends to work good in a live environment. So the bottom snare is there, play the two together. Very minimal. You'll hear that on headphones, but Minimal. But it's just a little bit more excitement with the bottom snare, just a bit more energy with it. So it's just very, very subtle. And then back to that top snare, uh, my SSL compressor, which I absolutely love, some of my favourite compressors. Uh, and that will be just, again, subtle, won't be too much. Very minimal movement at all. As you can see there, it's on auto release because I like it to, to dictate with snares because of the different transients, different attacks. You've got your grace notes, you've got your full hits. So I like the auto release to just kind of feel its way around and just see where we're going with it.
again, it's a very slow attack because I want the transients to come through. So again, minimal touch, minimal with the compressor. Just literally a couple of dB, no more than that. And again, just the BT compressor at the end is for the valve and for the warmth, and that's really all it's used for in that respect. Now with this one, with this drum sound, I immediately went for the natural sound of the kit and then added the plugins after. Can do it the other way around, sometimes I can put the plugins in and the natural microphone sound doesn't matter because it's coming straight into the box and straight through the preamps and everything in there. This was slightly different, I set it up and mic'd it up to have that 70s sound, so I had to kind of be a bit true to the, the microphone setup. Okay, so moving on to the hi-hat then. This is minimal in volume and I'll explain why when I get to the overheads because this is based on the overheads this kit. So these are all things just to bring sound up and just to add a bit of dynamic and a bit of dimension and depth to everything. Not to be in your face and not to be up front. So again, it's minimal. It's rolling off 200, uh, a little bit of 550 and 12.5K at the top just for the sparkle, just for that top end energy that we have in the hi -hats. Same with the toms really, it's not, again the toms are quite natural and it's purely because the overheads are doing most of the work. So with the tom, I've literally got, again, the SSL on there and I've got some quite heavy EQing on the toms and I'll get to that in a second when we go to the overheads. So what I tend to do with these is I tend to drop out everything below 65 hertz which is where your kick drum is going to be i tend to boost around between 70 and 80 so there's a balance between your bass at 80 and your kick at 60 you've got a bit to play with in the middle which is where i like to sit the toms so i usually would boost with the r bass boost the bottom end of the tom and then drop it which i was saying before about cutting it's a good trick sometimes to if you boost to cut around the boost just so you're not bringing all those frequencies in as well so that can help so yeah, like I said, with the toms, minimal stuff, mainly live, just to keep them there, to keep them up in the mix. So very natural sounding. It's a Gretsch kit, so it's going to be really natural, so there's no problems with that. So this is where it starts to get interesting when we move on to the overheads. It's a good idea when you've got kit sounds, especially if you're using live, to get your overheads nailed first. So get your overheads set up in the room where you want them, get them positioned. Make sure there's an even amount coming through. Make sure there's an even amount coming through from each one. Put them in a space where you can hear the kit, where you can hear the room, and then you can build it from there. So basically with the overheads, I've gone right over the kit. It's a spaced pair. Two cardioid microphones spaced away from the kit. So this is what we've got with just that kit sound alone. Well. So that is just the hi-hats on their own. Uh, so just the overheads on their own with nothing else. So the hi-hat is very prominent already. The snare is very prominent already. The kick needs to come in. So let's see how the toms sound when we've just with just the overheads. So there they are. So everything is within that space. Everything is within the stereo band of that. So if I then bring things in very, very slowly, it starts to build itself up. The kicks come in. There come the snares coming in. There comes the hi-hat coming in. Okay, so there's the kick sound. That's what we do. Okay, now the one other thing that I like to use, I'll just talk you through the overheads quickly. So it's very important with the overheads this is the most natural sound for the kit so it's the S ssl channel strip again uh see what's going on there's probably not very 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 slight um boost at about 14 just because i wanted a bit of air with this dropping again that frequency we keep talking about that 350 from the overheads getting rid of that completely quite a nice big chunk of that missing and um, very very minimal compression uh, you can hardly see it on the meter but it is there very very minimal that's just to keep control of it. Again, we talk about this cohesive thing with the control. So same with both those the stereos. Both the stereo overheads are in that. So then what I have is a little trick. Now this is where it gets interesting. A ribbon microphone, cascade ribbon microphone. Very dull, very different to the amount of um, frequency range that it picks up. And it's quite a dull microphone. So it's a mono version of it. And you can hear it almost sounds like a microphone from the 50s in the background. But what that does, that anchors the whole bottom end and gives you a little bit more grit and a bit more dirt to the sound. So if I bring the other overheads back in, already 
that bright sound we had before is warmer. Now in the, you can use, for this sound, you could just use a kick drum, a snare drum and that one overhead if you wanted to, just to create a bit more of a 60s sound. Your Motown kind of sound if you like, that's pretty much how they would have done that. But it's basically good to get a nice microphone set up and you can choose then how many microphones you want to use. You've just got to be careful with the phasing, which is always an issue with drums. And then finally with that, so just to talk you through what's on that quickly. Again, the SSL uh, channel strip for the warmth and just for it, the purity of its sound. Um, a little bit of uh, 12, just to give it, you would normally give that more, right? I would normally give that a lot more. So we would normally be looking at this for, uh, for it just because it's so dull in itself, we'd probably go, I'm there at the moment, we'd probably go to about there. And that's what they would do with Ribbon Micros, whack a load of top end on it and blend it into the mix. But because of the sound I'm going for, which is that 70s kind of feel, I'll just drop it off a little bit. Same again, the 350s not being touched on this because I need the fullness of the frequency spectrum. I want all of that within there. That is pretty much the heart of the, of the sound of the 70s sound, that's the heart, is the ribbon microphone. And then just some room microphones on the kit. Just to finish it off, space more than anything, nothing going on with the, uh, at all, I don't think on this with plugins. Nope, nothing going on at all with that. Again, natural. If it was a more forced kit sound, or it was something that had to be a little more deliberate, then you play more with the room heads. But they are just space. Nothing more than space. So if I put them in with the other overheads, you can just hear it getting a bit bigger. Subtle. Just a little bit more depth, a little bit more size, and a little bit more space. Now, if you're going for the sound I was talking about before with the depth, so I wanted Alex at the front and this big orchestra behind him, so you, there was no, you couldn't differentiate between necessarily, you could just hear everything coming at you. That really helps the kit to just fold itself out the back, just a little bit of space. Again, depth, key. But be careful overdoing things. The natural instrument was built for a reason. It was built as it was. We had plugins to things to suit our sound. And the only thing else I've added to the kit, particularly with that, was extra cymbals. And that's mainly because of the different mic placements in the room. It's just extra cymbals. It's nothing, there's nothing clever or technical about them. It's just additional cymbals uh, from Dan playing it live and then me sampling and using it back in. So it's live cymbals from the same kit using the same set of cymbals we use. Um, but just nothing major bottom end rolled off quite a heavy top end uh, at about two about 12 again at 12k so it's typical symbols nothing you, know, you roll the bottom end off up to about 120 because i've got enough of that going from the natural symbol sound of the kit so this is i wanted to get a bit more just a bit more sizzle and a bit more energy and a bit more power from the symbol that was all i was looking for i'm a massive gong fan <laughs> so there's a gong in here as well and that's mainly because of the orchestral nature of the track. I felt there was a big expression before Alex came in. It's an aggressive vocal, it's quite an aggressive track. So I felt a gong would push the sound. It's almost like, you know, somebody taking the cover off something for the first time and bang, there it goes. So it's a, it's a plug-in, it's a live gong, but it's again, one that we've, uh, that we've sampled. And just a little bit of, a little bit of mix saturation on this. This is another favourite plugin of mine, the PSP mix saturator. Again, a little bit of tape saturation, nothing major, just to taste, just to make it sit in with the mix a bit more, a little bit more warmth, and add a little bit more dynamic to it, and just just to bring it down a little bit, just to stop anything getting away. Now the only other thing with drums, and I won't take through this because it's similar to what we did. Uh, this is a completely different take. It's played by me. Uh, this is a totally different take and it was just a middle eight gap. What, I did it, what we did with this, we wanted, because it's a 70s sounding uh, song, we wanted to go for a 70s sounding fill. Um, and that kind of an interesting uh, sound. So it's a very big, there's no rooms in this. It's just the ribbon mic, two overheads, um, a snare drum and the kick drums. That's all we were using with this. And the very, very old skill sound. And it's just a little break. All we did. Trick that I've used on this, which I'll quickly show you. So that's the frame. Now, what I've done instead of using um, sort of sticking reverb on the group at the end or the 
the way we'd use it with group reverbs. I actually put quite a big um, Valhalla vintage reverb on just that ribbon mic I was talking about before. Now this kit sound on its own would, is a very 70 sounding kit. That sound. So again, if I just bring everything in slowly, you can hear where the reverb starts to take effect, but the kit becomes more natural sounding. If I take this reverb off, it loses all its dynamics. That could be from anywhere, any time in any moment in time. Add that little bit of reverb back on the and all of a sudden we're in a different time zone again. That's a lot more 64, 70. But that was the idea behind that. It was a 60s, 70s kind of James Brown Prince kind of funk break. That's why I recorded it, uh, drumming myself, as opposed to getting Dan to do it because it was two different cuts. Uh, and there's minimal stuff going on with that, with the exception of that ribbon mic, which is again, the SSL dropped out there, a little bit of filtering going on. Um, quite a heavy 10K on it because it, I wanted that one to be bright, brighter than the original tape because that's driving the whole song on its own. Uh, so that, yeah, again, nothing to be the bottom end going on there too much. Uh, no compression on it at all, because again, more natural sound. And then we've got the compressor going on there. Again, just for tube, for nothing you know too important. Just again to cohesiveness, just to keep it together. So we've got a little bit of uh, percussion going on, not much, just a tambourine, uh, just to help with the energy really, to push the track across. So there's not much, too much going on on this, or there shouldn't be. Yeah, vintage warmer again. The natural sound of the tambourine is enough. I've dropped a little bit of 8K out just for that tambourine peak when you hit it there's a little peak you can get rid of so the vintage warmer which is another great plug-in that I use be careful with this obviously again it can destroy a mix so a little bit of drive on it a little bit of tape saturation on it just to give it a bit of warmth a bit of grit a bit of character I think that's the best thing tambourines can be uh, quite characterless so that just gives it a little bit a little bit more and then to add to that we've got live congas that we put in but just EQ nothing on those at all but EQ A tiny bit of uh, for some reason I put some 500 there. There's a reason for that. I think it must have been to do some more. See, ah, to get the hit, just to get a little bit, a little bit more warmth on the hit. So nothing major going on with that either. There, nothing too, nothing too technical. Just a natural conga sound because they build the congas to sound that way. So I don't want to mess too much. Okay, moving on to the bases. This is where it starts to get interesting. We've got at the moment on this three separate bases running. So I'll take you through the first bass. It's a room microphone and a DI uh, with this particular bass. So I've got four tracks going. So let's have a look at the first two. So this is just the bass, natural DI bass. So I've got an auto align on this one because I was using um, a DI and a live mic. So we've auto aligned it just to make sure it's in phase properly. So we've got the R bass on again, which is a fantastic thing. So I'll drop that off. Still a good bass sound, still nice and fat, but again, it just fills that bottom end out. That's the 80 hertz I was talking about before, but very, very subtle with this R bass, very subtle. My new favourite plugins at the moment, the Fab Filter Collection, which I'm really enjoying using at the moment. A little bit of compression on that. It's a 4 1 ratio, which I tend to use for my basses. It's quite fast, a fast attack and a fastest release, and you can just see there, it's not doing too much to it. It's not really killing any dynamic it's just sucking in little pockets just little pockets just to keep it even just to keep it even nothing more just very very minimal about three two three db of compression coming in there so it's nothing nothing too too much a little bit of eq what we've got going on there quite heavy eq on it dropping everything out there underneath 30 not necessary for this sound a bit of a scoop around 200 and then a little bit of a lift Again, at the end, just to brighten it up a bit of 8K shelf, just to give it, you can hear the fret noise, you can hear his fingers moving, just more for that live energy sound as well. So that's the, quite low, because I don't really use that very loud. That's the uh, Rode room mic. Same same kind of um, plugins on there, but a little bit of reverb, which is interesting, just to create the depth of room. So I've loft all the bottom end there, just bringing up a little bit of the mids, and up all the top ends out as well so it's just to create a bit of pocket of dynamic for the bass to kick through 
so the two together. You've got the the DI, very dry, very punchy sounding, very uh, standard bass, and then you've got the microphone underneath, which just adds a bit more energy, just gives it again more of a live sound, and just helps to add a little bit more to the track. So then what we did, after we'd done this, we decided, mm, you know what, more of a wild sound, kind of a bit, something a bit more interesting. So we just added, played again though. We didn't double it, we played it again, and I'll tell you why in a sec. So this was the very heavily affected Acutron on the bass. We did it from the bass, so none of these are plugins from me. This was all done by Chris on his bass. Peaking going on there, so a bit, bit of top end again, 350 missing, uh, no compression on the SSL, that's coming from somewhere else, it's going from the fab filter. Again, so just touching it, really just keeping it there, it's just holding it in place so it sits underneath the other two. So if we bring the two back in, so that's natural on its own, just the two, two mic mics and the DI. Then bring the other bass in, and it's creating movement because of the wire and the filter. There's movement going on. But the reason why we recorded it twice, if you keep using the same thing on top of itself, we get this effect, and on top of it, we get this effect, and it just becomes a block sound. If you manipulate sound, you can create, move these gaps that are there, fill the sound out a bit more. So we decided to play it again. Now he had to be tight while he was doing it because he could have got messy. Luckily, he was, which was great. So that's basically a Qtron filter and a little bit of compression going on from him there. Then what we had going on just at the end of that was a bass synth because with it being criticized, with it being an 80s mix, I did want to bring some elements into it. So it's the same kind of feel as what Chris played on his. It was very bright, very punchy, very bright, loads of attack, most important of all. So when we drop the two in again, so live bass with the synth, Synth out, live bass in, synth bass in, Chris's other bass in. So you can hear all that energy, all that movement, all that action going on within the bass. So that's four different bass takes, which then all goes to a group at the end, uh, which probably got, that's what we got on there. That's the bass. So just a compressor, and that is a sidechain compressor for the kick drum, which you'll know about, just to keep the kick and the bass. So the kick is just a slight more priority over the bass, which is something that those of you who do dance music and electric music will know quite a lot of. Uh, that's just really there to help me space. Again, creating little pockets of space within the mix where we can sit things in. So there's nothing too, uh, too technical about that, just a nice group to keep me having control over it as a whole. All right, okay, just... This is what started the whole track was the clav. This is what got me interested in this arrangement of it, which is the clav sound. Uh, this is a, a clav from one of the plugins. It's quite dirty, it's got noise on it, which I liked because it's wired it. So I'm using the wire, an actual wire on it. So it's a bit a bit noisy, so I've got an X click on there to denoise it. Just touching it just to try and get rid of it. But I didn't want too much getting rid of it because I quite liked the sound with where I was going with it, so it was all. Very natural again, very 70s sounding. So live wire will create that kind of noise. So we've got an SSL on there again, a little bit of compressor and all that. Just a bit of compression going on. Um, not too much EQ, a little bit of the top end around 10. Again, that 351 being brought out and a tiny little 3.5 poke, just to give it that bit of extra um, attack, which is very important to it. Again, that goes to the groups. Okay, so moving on to the um, shamazin or shamazin, which is an oriental instrument. This is actually in the original. Um, it's not, not the same version, but I wanted to bring this in because it's my favorite part of the original. Uh, so I'll just play you that. So it's very much like a guitar, it's pluck strings, so you treat it, treat it very much like a guitar. So again on that, it's a natural sounding instrument. I keep using that word, but it's so important. It's a natural sounding instrument. So all I wanted to do with that was create space. And the way I created space was just to add a little reverb to it, just to give it depth again. So again, it's quite, it's a 2.5 delay. Um, it's quite, quite heavy on the mix. It's a 70% mix, so it's quite prominent as a reverb. I'll just play it without quickly. So that's 
that's with that with it. Which it has a lot more prominence and is more in your face, but doesn't have the same kind of vibe, character, most important thing. So that's that. So that just sits in on the middle eight and just adds a little bit of the original to it, just so we know it's there. Right, moving down then. So we're onto the piano, which basically is the verse kind of ambience. It's the anchor of the verse. As everything drops down, the piano just creates, just has that little bit of character to it. Let's play you that. So that's quite, again, I'll take you to the, I do have some effects on the group at the end, which I'll quickly show you. But this again, it's the piano, it's the high notes. So the transients of the high notes, the hit of the actual key from the piano, all those things were very important. So it's a bit of reverb, it's a little bit of, a tiny bit of compression and a tiny bit of EQ. So I'll play it without the reverb on again, you'll hear the difference. So again, static and in your face, quite prominent which is not obviously what I want. So there goes, there's the depth to it again. 2.5 milliseconds again, similar kind of uh, range. I don't want it to get too messy with the instruments. I want them all to kind of be together. So we've got a little bit of that on again, quite quite high in the percentage in the mix. So it's, it's washing over it quite heavily. Tiny bit of compression, classic compressor rather than a ratio compressor. Just again, barely touching it, barely touching it at all. And a bit more character, a bit of grit with the tube as well on there. So then we get to the solo roads, which is just a little break in the middle to play the whole Oh, hang on, oh, where I know. This is me organ. Again, I spent a long time getting the sound of the organ, so I didn't want to mess too much with it. So we've got a little bit of, it's coming in a bit hot, but I'll explain why later on. There's a reason behind that. So that's quite a heavy um, 10K. Not much compression going on, I don't think. Let me check it again. So tear, br brightness really, just top end, just to give it that little bit of, to poke it through. There's a lot going on in that part. So again, I'll play that in a sec. So there's no reverb, because I don't want this to be too washy. I want that to be prominent in your face. So I've took the reverb away from it. All right, so in the context of the whole song. The chamber did. Again, we're creating this depth, which is hugely important in mixes. Depth can be just as important as volume. You know, you're looking at it as a three dimensional, front to back, side to side. You know, it's an easy way of creating a little bit of depth. Just quickly, why you might see a few things going in hot, obviously beware of gain staging, but because I mastered this project, I know where I can get a little bit more out of it, a little bit more um, clipping. In, in some instances can be okay, but like I say, if I was mastering this, I have more control. If it was going off to be mastered, I wouldn't have things clipping. It's just because I know where in the mix it needs to be and where I'm going to compress it and how I'm going to do it. So because of time purposes, it was easier for me to master the project as well. So if you see a few things clipping, um, it's okay. Don't be scared of red. <laughs> People all, always are. Be wary of it, but don't be scared of it. Okay, so we've got two roads coming from the nodes. I, I had two, which I'll just play in both, but there's only one playing. Oh no, back on organs again, sorry. So this is the verse organ, so this is very a minimal, again, Natural sound, I spent a long time getting the road tree sound I wanted with the bars on the organ. A little bit of compress on this because it's just more static, it's more legato notes, there's not as much stabbing going on. So I wanted to just bring it all together and just bring some of the lows up. Just to, just to kind of, again, cohesive, that's another word we use a lot. And it needs to just sit in on that verse. So, with everything else that's going in the background, there's a reason that I use organs a lot when there's orchestras going on. If you don't have a chance to use real orchestras, I, I, I'm lucky that I can use a mix of live people and, and uh, plugins and things and, and instruments, but using organs, rotary organs, helps to create um, movement within the back. 
So if you've got a static string line and you put an organ underneath, it actually becomes an oscillating line. So it has more vibrato as if the player was playing it. So it's a little trick, usually viola range, stick an organ underneath and it just helps to bring everything out. So it's minimal stuff again with that. Uh, we've got, like I said, top, top EQ going on, a little bit of compression just to round it off. But mainly underneath for, it's for feel purposes more than anything that. But on the top of that, we have something else going on, which is more of the prominent one. Now this is kind of a, a Mellotron organ, if you like. So this was ambient more than anything else. So with the organ together on top of itself, you can feel the two working together. One's a little lower, one's a bit brighter, so they complement each other pretty well. And again, that's the reverb that's doing, that's the fab filter reverb that's doing most of the work, which is my new favorite one at the moment. Without anything, still an ambient sound, still sounds great. Can't really hear much difference, but it's there when the tail goes, which is more important. So same again, little bit of top, tiny little bit of, of compression from the SSL, which is just holding it together because it's legato notes again, so I don't have to worry about too much space in the instrument. So we can use that. It's like a, if you were painting, it's one big colour, one big block colour across to, to go in with all the other colours that you've used. So it's the grass of the picture, if you like, you look at it that way. Uh, I'm just going to this organ. So this bottom organ, I'll see what's going on in this one. All right, this is the chorus organ. So again, same thing. I spent a long time getting the sound. Uh, so it's just a bit of reverb, just a little bit less this time because it's more staccato notes on the swell. I don't want the tail to hang over too much. So if you listen, it's a bit quicker in its stop. It's kind of gone there. And it's kind of gone there. So the combination, again, I'm lucky that I can use a combination of both. So I can get a hold of live Hammonds, which we can use. And I do have some very good uh, of the Nord stuff. And I do have the um, Contact V4 plugins, which I use. Knowing Hammonds like I do, I'm lucky that I can use the plugin to emulate the actual Hammond rather than me going, I wonder what that does and this does and that does. I can actually, I know what the bars do on the Hammond. Same with the wheel, it says the roads, some of them are live natural roads like we have out there. Some of them are plugins. It's a combination. If you can use the two to blend live strings, one violinist over a, an instrument violin sounds 10 times better. So if you can get all the things like that, just to add a little bit of character. The thing with today's modern music, with electronic music and, and dance music, because there's not as much live instrumentation going on, the producers today have to get a lot cleverer, which is some brilliant production out there, watching some of these videos that I've been watching from the Future Music site, some amazing ideas, some very, very clever, innovative stuff. I don't have to do that so much with this project because I have live people playing. So adding their souls to the record is as much as me doing production to it and adding tricks. I don't have to do that because they've added the tricks for me. So it's a kind of, I can use a bit of both. I find that for me personally is the best way of using a combination of live. So this is a live, my actual Wurlitzer. This is just the verse intro. So that is an actual Wurlitzer. You can even hear the hiss on it and the crackle and everything. Because I didn't want to take any of that off. There's a little bit of the crackle and noise, but that's just that just comes with the wheel. It's a, so that's quite a lot going on with that. I've got the uh, the SSL on there again, mainly doing a lot of my EQ work with that because it's a very very precise EQ and I really enjoy it for that. There's not as much compression. Again, with it being legato notes, there's not a huge amount of compression going on there either. It then gets to the reverbs. This is all about the reverbs with this again. There's two on with this one. There's the vintage reverb from Valhalla, which I use, which is this one. And that is really the ambient reverb. That's the one that creates the vibe, gives you the feel of the track, gives you the sensation of where it is in the mix. So the other one I was using is the Fab Filter reverb. Now this is more for the placement of the track than anything. So it's more a room sound. So I've created a natural room from the source. So from a world, so there is no reverb, there is no ambience. So I've created at first the natural room ambience of the world, so as if we've recorded it and mic'd it up with the speakers, which you can do. I didn't in this instance because it's noisy. Then what I do, once I've added the, the stock room reverb, so it's just a live sound, then I can start messing with the ambience, which I did with that one. So we add the, so there we've got bigger, deeper, wider everything and that's again legato notes for the feel so 
again, filter, compressor, not doing very much at all. If anything, just waiting for any transient that's peeking over the top just to get rid of it. But again, with legato notes, there's not as much. It's literally taking probably 0.2 of a dB off there. Again, you've got to be careful. It's easy to compress, but watch what you're doing when it comes to live instruments, because you can just compress the whole tone out. One of my favorite parts on the whole uh, Criticize record is the piano. Now this is just an east-west stock plug-in piano, but I've spent ages getting the sound that I wanted for it. So again, nothing comes too easy. You've got to work at it. So again, it's a similar kind of feel. If I take everything off, I've just got a basic piano. Nothing to, you know, there's, there's the reverb from the actual piano sound itself, but I brought it right down, so it's very, very minimal. Again, my favourite SSL that I put on everything, a cut to get the lows, just under 70 again. Probably not much going on there, but I'll get rid of it anyway because it takes up space. Something I'll get to in a sec. Slightly more, about 3 dB of, of compression coming in, just a normal ratio, 2 1, nothing too heavy. Again, that 350 we talk about, gone, doesn't need to be there. And a little bit of uh, 10, 10.5, quite 6 dB, quite a big push in that. Generally for brightness, because it's a bright piano sound that I wanted. So if we put all these together. So it's setting the tone for you. Everything's becoming more exciting. Everything's getting bigger, getting ready for the chorus to explode. So we're kind of setting things up slowly. So when we finally do get to the chorus, we just have the roads left. Which I think this one is the Nord Rose, yeah, I think it is. So this is just the basic chords. Now this is the Wurlitzer sound from the Rhodes, which is strange that I would have used my normal Wurlitzer, but it had a tone and a place and an attack to it. As you can just hear there's a little slightly more attack to it than there would normally be on a on a Wurlitzer. So I kind of went for that. Nothing too tricky again, this Valhalla reverb. You can hear it for yourself. It that gives it the life. I like to think of it as dressing things up. I, I always use analogies. It's, uh, you it's how you dress it. You know, you've got a nice looking sound there. Why well, do you dress it? Give it a nice coat. Give it a nice hat, and there she goes. She's away. So same SSL again. Mainly EQs. There's the 350 again. We talk about. There's the three at 10.5. You know, you can look at EQs like your hi-fi, you turn more tone up, more top, that's about 10.5 to 12k on your hi-fi. You can kind of gauge it as you're going along if you're not familiar with EQs, you can kind of just get a few points of an EQ and then work your way around it. That little trick as well people talk about, finding your resonant peak is also a good one, so if you quickly just bring the Wurlitzer up, you know, get yourself a little peak and work your way around, find frequencies that you don't like. Obviously, I've done them all, so they're okay. That's your resonant peak, that's what that's called. Ugly frequencies when you sweep, just bring them down a bit, not too high with the peak, you know, just a little bit, and just roll them out just to get rid of them. And that helps clean a mix up loads. You'd be surprised just how much you can get away with it. Uh, there's a little solo on there, but it's the same road sound, we're using the same effect, so there's nothing too, too much on that. Probably just slightly less, yeah, just, just the reverb again, but less, same, same EQ settings on the SSL. A little bit less on the reverb, that's just something I added myself just to uh, on the on the break. Yeah, straight. There's that reverb again. But with this time round, there's a lot less decay. It's only 1.17, so there's a lot less on it. So you can hear that compared to how the other one was when I give it a bit more. So that's roughly the reverbs for the others. But that has less because I want that with it. Again, it's staccato notes, there's no legato in it, so it's quick. Everything has to be quick. So, with quick instruments, quick playing, the compressors and the reverbs work quicker. You can't have them longer because they get out of the way. Don't be too bothered about, oh, how much millisecond is my reverb compared to how the tempo of the track is. That's great, fantastic if you can do that, but there's not loads of people out there who are bothered with that, so don't get too technical. It's all by ear. Now there is another Rhodes there which I didn't use, I'll just play you quickly, this was my second Rhodes I was going to use, which has a bit of a dirtier sound, but I'd added that much with the rest of the instruments that we didn't need it, so I'm dead simple. So that's all the keyboards, now just quickly onto the group that I used, I group everything, I'm very specific about groups, so kicks, snares, toms, overheads, whole kit, bass, all guitar, left and right guitars, then into guitar groups, strings and brass go into an orchestra group, 
all vocals going to, and I'm a bugger for it, and I just have to put everything in groups. It's easier to control. Dave Pensado says, for every time you add a group, you lose something, but we gain something. I agree with that totally. So my groups are very, very, it's almost like another mix. It's a three-stage mix. We mix the drum set, mix the drum kit, we put it into a group. We mix the drums with the bass, with the guitar, with the keys. It's like a double mix. So once you've done your mix, you can almost stem mix again. So it's like a double mix. You can mix on the fly these days, which is what we do a lot of. I'll just quickly show you this group. Uh, right, so on the keys group, I've got just the Q1 just to bring it down, just to stop any um, any peaks coming through. The, the Arvox, again, is more of a gate than anything else. It's just an easy gate to throw on. Um, I get a little bit of 12.5 on the, just to brighten the whole keys up. A little bit of 10 just to give them a shelf. Um, the whole thing though. Don't usually EQ a group, but on this instance, it was enough. The compressor's there just to uh, for warmth and the tube again, and a bit of a gain, just because I didn't want to mess with the levels. So I just brought the whole lot of keys up again. So that's quite straightforward with those. So on to, on to the guitars. There's not as many guitars in this track as we'd normally use. Um, so two mics, an SM57 and a, a Rode M3. So there's your 57. Quite an old, again, old 70s sound we went for. This is a, a very expensive Telecaster that we borrowed, uh, if I can remember rightly for it. Going through a roll and damp. That's one mic, that's the 57. So again, just the, the SSL channel with a little bit of EQ and tiny bit of compression. A gate to stop any of the hiss. But only subtly, because I don't want to lose too much. You know, you start getting a pumping effect then if you lose much. Uh, so again, reverb is what's driving that. Again, I'm a big fan of reverb creating space. Overuse, you can kill a mix. Underuse, you can really get it. So there's a tight, very dry, no, not much depth. There's the room sound. That's more of a room than anything else. Again, talk about getting the sound from source, adding your room sound. So if you've not got a big room to record in, the best trick I can suggest is if you don't have a big live room and you want a live sound, Put a room reverb on first and then affect it with the reverb afterwards. It gets a double thing, which be careful, especially with the density and the frequency of the reverbs. So again, we'd say probably the same with the M3, which is a, a, a cardioid version of a, of a Dynamic 57. S slightly further away and slightly more reverb to just give it a bit more depth again. So one on top of itself. So that's just the far reverb. Just the air reveal. So the two together blend really well. So that's those two. There's another guitar part on here which is from the original again, something that I really wanted to do. Uh, Jelly Bean Johnson, who originally wrote Criticised with Alex and played all the guitars on the Jam and Lewis stuff, this is one of his parts. So I kind of, I played this myself, going for a Sly and the Family Stone kind of feel, used a Telecaster clean straight into an amber, played with my thumb. Uh, the same way Sly Stone played a lot of his stuff. Uh, this is two mics again, a 57 and an M3. So basically me playing with the thumb, no pick, just clicking the guitar as hard as I could to create that kind of sound. For those of you that know funk music or listen to that, that's how you get that sound. It's a thumb. So again, there's nothing on that at all. No compression, no reverb, uh, not anything on that because I wanted to do that. Then I stuck it into a group. That's when we start messing with the reverb again. Just the Valhalla stuff. Very, very small though. Room sound. Room sound. Okay, take off. So we've got a nice, dry, uninteresting sound. You know? And then we go with the reverb, slightly more interesting. So understanding reverb is a huge, huge part of production. If you can understand where each reverb comes from, each moment in time what reverb choices they had it really opens up your your possibilities so again with this we've got the fab filter on it just rolling off uh, everything probably around yeah, 30 not needed uh, it's a quite a bright sound anyway so i didn't need that and some of your low mids and a tiny bit of a shelf not really uh, making any relevance to it uh, about nine decibels at 10 just because with me playing it a certain way with no um, pedals and everything, it was a slightly duller sound than I normally would have had, so I had just a little shelf on there. So. Well, that was from the original, so I had to keep that, it's one of my favourite parts of the whole thing. Uh, so the final guitars were B Digger's guitars, and obviously he's the meat of the song when it comes to guitars. Alex is a huge fan of, of Digger and, and he's playing, 
and how he plays. So I'll just take you through the verse guitar quickly. <laughs> So again, same 57s and M3s, two mics. So this one, because he's Digger's a lead guitar player, he plays slightly different with a bit more dynamic. So I'll give the compressor on first this time, just to kind of put a lid on it, just to keep control of it. Nothing big, it's nothing major, it's not slam, slamming it or anything. It's just a little subtleties there. Right, it's a fast release, again, because it's staccato, so the release needs to be quick, so the compressor's not staying on it for too long. So it has time to go back and reset and start again. So we have there about 1.2 dB of compression. That's all we're using. And the same with the EQ coming. Quite, quite a lot going on, quite a big scoop going on there. 300, 160 to 300 to 500 there. So there's three, making a nice little scoop. Uh, because again, it's a chunky kind of guitar sound. I wanted the bottom ending, so I've only dropped it out at 20. I've just dropped there. And a bit of a shelf, again, five decibels at 9.3, just for brightness. Uh, dropped a bit of 600 out there with that kind of, where you start to get the midi cross between the low and the mid peak. And I've dropped a bit of three out because there was quite a lot of 3K on his actual guitar unit. So I dropped that out just to kind of, uh, just to compromise with the sound. And again, just a tube compressor on there, not really doing any compressing, just there for the sound and the valve valve sound from it. So Digger's guitars are similar all the way through. Um, after this one, now this is a slightly heavier guitar sound and reason why, because if you listen to the original Criticize, Jelly Bean has a very big Van Halen style distorted guitar going through the chorus, so I wanted a bit more with this. A slightly heavier sound. Now the compressor is hitting a little harder on this one because there's more legato notes, longer notes. So I want these to come up in the mix a little bit more. So the ratios are the same at four and the attack and the release are, are fast at 17 uh, milliseconds and at 200 milliseconds. So again, legato and staccato have two different release and uh, attack. If you nail your attack and your release right with your compressors, your life will change. So, you know, you all of a sudden you'll wake up one day and go, oh, I can do this, you know? <laughs> if, if, otherwise you can mess yourself up. So slightly more distorted, slightly heavier, slightly heavier compression just to bring it together. And then I think we've just got his solo left, which is the verse solo. I wanted to link the two with this, talking about the arrangement. We've gone out of the, a big chorus. We've gone into a big swell. Where do we go now? Well, we need to link between the second verse. So I thought a nice guitar solo keeps the power and the energy of the track up, doesn't lose any of the excitement of the track, then brings us into a verse, which I deliberately took everything out of from the first verse, so it's very bare. So we're going from quite big to very little to quite big, which creates, obviously, a lot of excitement within the track. So let me double check what this uh, part is. And this is bridge ending. So all we did with that, we wanted to, to uh, still you say criticize, just just to double the track, just to double Alex's vocal there. So it's the same sound as the one above it. Again, using the uh, the delay, the timeless delay, which I'll show you, which is on the uh, the group at the end. Again, not within a rhythm, but quite washy, so it, it has its own um, dynamic range and its own way of filtering through the track. You, know, you can be too rigid with your tempos and you and you you know quarter notes and your eighth notes and things like that you start to lose a little bit of of energy so on the guitar groups uh, just quickly again just a little bit of eq a little bit of, of 12 i dropped a little bit of 180 out that kind of where the guitars get a bit thuddy and a bit chunky at the bottom um and there's nothing else really on that group just again the, the compression for the uh, for the valve but not actually doing any compression so then the solo, which is what I'm just going to show you. Same sound again, which was good because we managed to keep the same kind of continuity throughout. And we just brought him out slowly. So on that, like I said before, is the delay for us to drop your delay out of there. You can just hear it's a little bit more rigid. It's still a tiny delay on his on his pedal board because I, li I like to set the sounds as well. I don't just like to give a flat sound all the time and then do it. I like them. If you're working with a band, the band have to be happy. You don't remember this as a producer. You have to make them happy. They have to want to do this. 
So they have to be interested in the sound that they're playing in the first place. So I just added a little bit more of a parallel delay just at the end, just to take the delay from the initial sound and just lengthen it a little bit. Again, be careful, it gets washy, it starts messing in, be careful. So that's the guitar. So again, back to the group, everything's the same. A little bit of EQ, a little bit of compression, nothing more. So we're getting to the main crux of the song now, which is the strings and the brass, and this is where it starts to get, this is where it picks up in its energy. Again, a combination of live strings, live sampled strings of people playing it that have been sampled. So there's a combination of everything going in. And basically with this, what I'll tend to do is I'll arrange everything. Um, sometimes we'll score it out before we do it just to see it, or most of the time we'd, I'll just go with, with ear and how I feel. And then I put everything into a group. And the reason why I do this is because a violins don't go on their own, nor does a cello, nor does the, the, the bass, nor does a the trumpet. They go together in an orchestra. So I kind of look at them like an orchestra. So all my strings go into an orchestra group, which is then treated as if it's one stereo recording of the orchestra. So I'll just play a little bit of the intro strings. And I'll talk you through the group. Again, so on, on the end, I will just EQ the whole string section, drop out some low ends, just bring a few mids in, scoop some low mids, bring a bit of top up. Again, the same. Usually what I'll do also is I then put it into an orchestra group with the brass and I affect that. So there's a little bit of the Valhalla reverb on there as well, that 70s reverb to give the space. So take it off, just a bit from there. carries on going and depth we keep talking about depth again now with this I'm behind Alex so there's nothing over the top of his vocal so the reverb is going after his vocal with the strings behind so again into that group with the orchestra just a little bit of EQ and quite a heavy reverb so if I put stick the brass in they're going a separate thing as well See they are. okay so, so with them again it's not four people in a room brass, that's not what we're going for, so it's not in your face and, and kind of right there. This is a big brass section, there's only two with Bob and AJ, but we double, sometimes bring trombone players in. Again, it's depth, I don't want it to be in your face, I need them to be back in the distance, so it sounds like there's ten of them playing instead. So again, it's all on the choice of reverb. So that's... There's a little bit of parallel going on there. We get rid of that. There we go. So there's already on the channel from the brass. I'm going to find that and get rid of that. There we go. So on that brass channel there, we've got a vintage warmer again. Trumpets can be dead scratchy if you're not careful with the mic placement. So we've got a vintage warmer on again with the tape speed up to full. Be very careful with that. Tape speed up to full is better quality, so just watch that if you're using the PSPs. Not much drive going on, I just really want the warmth and just to get, again, cohesive, this word we use a lot, just to get that together. And we've got the saturation on it, again, slightly more tape emulation, which is never a bad thing with brass or this kind of sound, if you do it subtly. Taste is the word, to taste is my favourite phrase. Like I said, adding the brass and the strings to one group, again, creates that orchestra feel. So I have more control. So I have to have the separate group strings and then the brass, then we put them together as an orchestra group. So we're having a little bit of control over it. So you can do more then. You can have more reverbs on, harder compressors, and you're only controlling the one channel as opposed to individual ones. So it's something, if you get your brass from source, it's a lot easier. Your natural sound, again, more natural. So the whole thing as an orchestra, quickly through the verse. <laughs> There's the reverb missing. Put it back in. Just hear them. We're on the timpani there, isn't it? The timpani just disappears. Another trick if you're using stock strings and instrument strings, put the timpani in there, playing with the kick drum or playing with the bass note. Something to add more authenticity to your string section. Why not? I've, I've played the, the timpani as a timp, timpani player would do, playing the two notes, playing the B and the A, like a timpani player would play. And it does 
help to add with the instrument strings and the live violins and things. It helps to add that little more authenticity to it. So same with the chorus. Stabs. Brass is only stabbing. So that's the whole thing. So that is basically two, three live people and a lot of instrument and a lot of care and attention into what's going on to make it sound like that. We haven't all got huge soundstage budgets, have we? So we've got to be careful with what we do. And uh, the one last thing, just two little quick things to show you. I've also added French horns into that. Now from the instrument, this is a John Barry thing, a Bond thing that I'm mad on. So if you add low French horns, there's registers in tracks, there's registers in an orchestra. So if you're losing a bit of bottom end in an orchestra, add a bottom end instrument to it. Can be an inst a stock instrument, do not be a live one, but use the registers of each instrument. A violin has a high register, cello has a low register. So don't confuse your registers if you're trying to make good sounding strings with instruments. You know, you can, there's a way for, a ways for it. Adding that French horn really makes a difference, especially on the stabs. So we stick it all in. We take them out. So we've lost our bottom end all of a sudden, haven't we? So they're out. And come back in again. So there's that power of the bottom end coming back. So the only last musical uh, instrument thing is choirs. So it's a vocal thing usually, but again, this is using a combination of the, the lads in the room doing, or me mainly doing the, the choir, and an actual uh, plug in choir. It's the East West orchestral um, choir bank that I actually used. So this is a combination of us singing and an actual choir. And that's heavily reverbed again. But with no reverb, it's, it sounds like a flat sound. It could be anything. Yeah? Vintage Valhalla reverb, a lot of decay this time. We're going sort of like up to five with it. People sometimes are fear putting that amount of reverb on something. But if you know where it's going, if you know where that's going and it's blending into the strings. So again, we're using a combination of live people singing and, a, and an instrument plugging, but we've created a live feel from it. So that's a nice trick to use. All right, finally then we've done, uh, we're onto the backing vocals, which is just basically uh, five, five of the girls that we use um, singing live as they would do. And again, very little in terms of plugins on this, because I wanted to do it as a group at the end. The only trick I've done with this, what I found was there wasn't enough power in the backing vocals. There wasn't enough, not from them, from the actual on top of the track. So I thought to myself, I went through a lot of different things and ended up adding distorted vocals to it, which was very kind of new for me. It's not something I would usually have done, but I'll just quickly give you the difference in. So we've added. And There's the vocal. You don't realize. I just want no distortion. Till you say criticize. So one more time with no distortion. You just close your mind. Ooh. Okay, and then I'm gonna bring it in. You don't realize. And you can just hear all of a sudden there's more going on in the background, and we get this other um mismatching different transients and different sounds instead of it all being on top of itself so you're getting blocks you're getting this nice blend again to get the distortion to sound like that you can put it on as a parallel which helps this i wanted it to be quite prominent and quite in your face so i basically doubled the track so it's two of rachel's vocal which play the two together so it's rachel's normal vocal as it is and, ooh, which is this one ooh, and there's a that's the distorted version the two together. I just want what is right, still you say criticize. I'm gonna bring Fran back in and myself back in and Camilla back in. Ooh, ooh, so you can hear you it, it's very prominent. It's very prominent in the group mix when you solo it like that, but sticking it in the track, it disappears behind the actual backing vocal. So again, that's something to taste, something you have to play around with. Uh, and for the backing vocal group, that just all goes again to a group. And I've got the fog filter again going there, which is the compressor just to tie it all together and keep it glued. 
Time. The best thing, if you're not sure, slower attack beats fast every time because the compressor has time to reset and start again. So always think about that when you're getting for a, a uh, an initial plug-in sound with your compressor, always start with the slower attack. A slightly faster release so it lets it through again. You and just, just closed your just mind. Ooh, ooh, when I turn ooh, it off, you can, you can a subtle you can hear don't it. Realize. Just I just lid. want what is right, still you get say criticize. And it's just a nice way of finishing it off. So same with the with the other backing vocals. Um, and then we've got mine, which is the just the last thing is my little Prince um, tribute to Prince, because Alex is obviously from Minneapolis and he had uh, obviously those of you who know him know the history with Prince um, and what he did to him and how all that happened. So it wasn't a more the Minneapolis sound, it was more that I wanted to bring to it. Uh, I wasn't really happy with our mid late at all, so we kind of added this new, total new mid late for it. And this is me, oh, oh, oh. my little prince kind of. Uh... So again, we're going for lots of guys in a room, shut your eyes and think Paisley Park, big room, big stage, big, you know, I, I look at that, I know how, it, how Paisley Park looks. Look at it like that, shut your eyes and think guys in a room together, all, all kind of singing, even though it's one guy doubled up. So on that, we've got, I've got a doubler going on, which is four times the vocal, just to make it slightly wider, even though I've got uh, eight going there at the same time. So the, the doubler is very subtle, it's just on. Now what I've done is, I've turned off the direct source, so this is running parallel, you turn off the direct source so you don't get it twice and then basically just add a couple um, 45 degree pans. I think it's very, very minimal. It's 23.7 delay on one and 9.4 on the other. So they're very, very, very subtle, but they just help to create that little more space. And then obviously the last thing is the reverb. So if I take both those off and play that. More of a room. Not quite as big. Back on. And there creates the depth again. If you use a room reverb, you can add more percentage of the mix level. If you're adding a plate reverbs and big reverbs, be careful how much you add. That's that's the trick with that. So smaller smaller room sounds with a bigger sound, bigger time can help create a bigger sound that isn't as washy that you have more control over. And then finally, when once everything's gone into to groups, there's a little bit of a Tokyo EQ, which I love, um, against the Dave Pensado thing, something that he does, and I kind of copied him. This is quite heavy on the uh, 10K, it's about 5 dB on that, just to brighten the whole music up. It doesn't touch the vocal, it goes into a separate music track, just it touches it a little bit, and then I send it to the to the out. Got a little bit of one, uh, yeah, 1 1.6 on there as well, just for punch. Because uh, it's a deep song, and because we're going for a big deep sound, you kind of got to help the mids out occasionally. You've just got to help them through sometime. So that touches the music side of it, doesn't touch the vocal, then goes into the final, um, my plugins at the end. And basically this is just for me to, before I send it to mastery, and this is just my little touch myself. Again, the SSL channel strip, which I've, you've seen I've used a lot of, that's on there, but doing nothing just to give it character. There's no EQ dropping out, no compression or anything. My Tokyo's on again, not always, but this is just bringing some air. So you can't, 20 kilohertz, you don't always hear that. It's not always prominent, but sometimes mentally, you put in two decibels on as a producer, you go, yeah, that sounds brighter. It might not always, mentally it does. If you can set mentally, you'll go a lot faster, a lot quicker, a lot further. Once you have mental battles in your head, oh, is that right? Oh, and you're questioning. So sometimes you have to just do something that makes your brain think, yeah, I'm happy. And if you take it off, you wouldn't know. Well, that's just a mental thing, just sometimes to set you up. But not in this instance, again, deep song needed a bit of air helping out. So that's that. And then one of my favourite little tricks at the end is this LMB, which is a linear phase multiband from Waves. And again, all I do with that is I touch the bottom end, 
I touch the top end and then I just pull the master down. So each band of the compressor is very subtly just keeping everything together. You can bang that on a mix as it is and people go, wow, that's just made it sound like a, a proper song straight away. And if I just play a little bit of the track without any of the final plugins on, start with the intro. She looked better when you put things down. finalizing before it goes to master in this case which was me so it was okay but before it goes to master it was just finalizing and then the just the very very final thing on it is the SSL compressor which again I love um, very 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 quick release and a very very slow attack to let everything through because it's mastering because there's 180 odd tracks playing at the same time there's no space you have to create space so which I've done with that and if you watch it it's not it all together it's the glue of the track and that's what kind of keeps everything again mentally you look at it and you think right I've got everything controlled and where I need it to be and once you look at it that way it frees your mind up for the mix so that is just about everything for that I could go deeper I could spend hours and hours more going into it but you've not got the time and I've not got the time either so uh, that's where we're up to with that Okay, so we're into the vocals and Mr O'Neill is with me here to talk through them. I'll just basically tell you what we did uh, and how we recorded it and then see if Alex wants to tell you a little bit about his feelings on the vocal takes. Um, so basically with this, I have the same chain. I have two separate chains for Alex, um, which I'll go through. This is the main chain that I use for most of the vocals that we record. Um, so basically for this, just a little de on it, which takes a little bit of um, about three and a half of Alex's voice. I like to keep control of it around that frequency. Um, just for power purposes and then we've got the SSL channel on it which has got high pass and low pass filters just to round things off again that frequency we talk about the 350 which is out there again which causes muddiness so we get rid of that for clarity purposes um, we've got a reverb on the actual track itself which I'll play in a sec but I'll just show you through it first so quite a big um, quite a long time on this one so about 2.3 uh, just to create again a little bit of depth on it. I don't want to be too much on the vocal because you can do the parallel stuff later on So I didn't want too much on it at that point We've got a little R box on there Which is a great little vocal compressor just to, again to finish off any transients that I've got through with the reverb on We can just bring those down afterwards Try not to compress before the reverb too heavy or after the reverb too heavy Just somewhere in between to get a nice balance to keep control of it So then we've got again something I use loads on with on with vocals is the vintage warmer it's not doing anything specifically it's just on and that just adds a little bit of grit and a little bit more warmth to it again which Alex doesn't really need but it's just there to enhance what's already there and then we've got the mix saturator again tape saturation again just for some more warmth a little bit more character and just to keep just a little bit more control again vocals are all about control I'm not a huge huge fan of automation this is gonna sound weird to a lot of people not a huge fan of automation I'm a huge fan of getting the levels right. I like to go in and cut and volume myself. Automation can get a bit messy sometimes when there's a lot of things going on, especially a lot of vocals. So I like to try and keep as much control as I can first before I have to do any automation. And then again, the compressor on at the end, just to finish it off. That'll you know, it's so amazing because now you're telling me, you're giving us the technical aspect of how my vocals get the sound the way they do. I get the luxury of coming in as an artist and just going, you know, can you just do this? Or can you do that? Or can you do this? And 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 not thinking that it he's got to go through several processes to get my voice to where we both feel comfortable with where it should be, mm -hmm. you know. And I often equate what Alex does uh, in the studio, uh, and it's it's kind of difficult, but when you Recorded in a lot of top studios, especially in Los Angeles, and you, if you ever had your record mastered by a mastering lab in, in uh, Los Angeles called Bernie Gernman, mm -hmm. if you ever had your record, then you would be so spoiled that you wouldn't. It would be very difficult for you to work with other people. And working with Alex, coming to Manchester, working with Alex and and Jay and the whole Mama Freedom crew has been wonderful because he really 
He's got a, he's got my voice down pat. He knows how to get that, get the sound out. That's that that's going to complement what we're trying to achieve. And that's that's basically all all we're doing, is trying to get the best sound we can. It's not about I like it, you like it. Yeah. It's it. Is it the best? Yeah. Yes, it's the best. So that's what we're always trying to achieve. And now I'm getting to know. All of the processes <laughs> that you go through just to get just me to get happy, it, uh, get uh, me uh, happy. Get you <laughs> up, uh, the thing with Alex's voice is, you get artists who don't need much doing to them. Some some people feel that they have to throw all kinds of stuff on. All I have to do is make Alex sound as good as he is. That's the trick. Not doing. I don't have to do any more or less to him. I just have to make him sound as good as he is. Enhance all his qualities, and that's all I try and do. His he his plug-in strip is different to anybody else's. He has his own unique strip. Alex likes a specific amount of reverb, so I always have a parallel reverb running, which is something you chose, didn't you, eventually? It was after a few sessions, Alex wanted a specific depth of his reverb, so this is where we talked about not saturating the reverb on the main vocal and just adding it in later. So if I just play you... Can't you find something else to talk about? So that's with all the reverb. Is on. this song the only one you sing? If I just take out. Makes you look better when you put things down. One. Who values your opinion? And just drop out any reverbs. Let's put a delay on there as well. Out, 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 out. Can't you find something else to talk about? So that's dry of reverb. Is this song the only one you sing? Alex's Makes you look added. better really when you when put recording. things down. Who values your opinion? One just for a little bit of depth. Don't criticize my friends. So that creates criticize my the big space that we were talking about before with Alex sitting on top with the band in the background and him being nice and prominent. But he doesn't sit too far on top. He kind of blends in with the band, but not doesn't disappear behind them. And that's controlling the reverb, controlling the compressor, and the vocalist, obviously, as well. Well, I think that, you know, one of the important things to know as a vocalist when you're recording is that tone. Tone is so important. Listen, I couldn't express it enough. I learned this many years ago, and that's the reason why my approach to recording is pretty much like a surgeon. You know, I'm, I'm in, I'm going to do the surgeon, somebody else close, you know. <laughs> okay, close <laughs> it up, you know, and that's... The way my approach, is, my approach is because of the fact that over the years I have learned the importance of tone. And it's so difficult for a producer like Alex or any producer to really give you the best record you can get if the tones don't match up. They have to match up. So you have to have this approach to it. Everything I do is... I'm trying to get the same tone that I approved of. If I if I got a tone in the song and I said, okay, that was the one, that was the one. So all night doing that whole recording session, that's the tone that I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to give the producer. I'm trying to give him, so when he, if I'm really trying to difficult, make his job much more difficult, as difficult as I can, because you know I want to give him so much good stuff until he has so much stuff to choose from. And all of it's good, so it's kind of like, okay, well, this good, that's good. And you get that type of uh, agreement with two people working together when you approach it from a tone point of view. When a lot of vocals go in and they want to sing it like they hear it or like they sing it, well, that's fine. The feeling and the passion should be there. But also, technically speaking, you got to go in there and you got to find that tone is even. So you give them that same tone during that whole thing. So once the producer gets your recording, it makes his job, it's like so much easier. And, and, and yours as well. So, you know, it's tone is so much important in the process of recording a record. It really is. Yeah. We have a way of doing it as well. I developed, Alex is so fast when he records. He's very, very quick. He wants it there, there, there. Sometimes I have four tracks running at the same time recording with Alex. I don't do this with anybody else. It's just because he's so fast when he records. He can give me the whole song three times. Then he might decide he wants one line. He might decide he wants one word. He might decide he wants to do the whole thing again. But the tone is always the same. So I have to be so fast. He might want to do a whole phrase, but with just one word out. So I have to bring that for him and I have to keep him moving. So to keep his energy levels up, to keep, keep him happy so he can perform. 
you know, I can't keep singers waiting, you can't keep them, or oh, just hold on a minute, that's not right. You know, so you have to be on the ball, you have to move fast with vocalists' qualities, Alex, you have to be quick, quick, quick to get the job done. But it's one of the things that, you know, as a vocalist, you've got to challenge yourself. Your discipline level, when you walk into these types of environments, has to be spot on. You got to, you got to be disciplined. You and you, you I mean, you got to actually know what you want to achieve. You have to have order within your whole process of going into this thing. So when I come into the studio, I'm I'm already gotten prepared for that session like two days before. I'm already there, and the closer I get to my time, if my time is seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night, when I come in, I'm like already there. So. You know, it's about having your focus, man, and, and being so focused mm -hmm. when you come in to do this. Uh, it just and it and that whole process is different uh, from the creative aspect of it. From and it's so different from anything that you could do live on stage or anything like that. That is so different. Mm -hmm. You know, this requires a whole another type of artist, a type a whole another type of beast. So, if you can put the all the get the it's a conjunction of things. If you can get them, put them all together, then it's going to be much more pleasant for you and, and whoever you're working with. So, you know, it's a good thing. So you remember when we first did Criticize, yeah. you spoke to me about you wanted the vocals to be a bit more, a bit harder, didn't you? A bit more, yeah. have a bit more aggression to well, them? Well, I, I did because, you know, you know, I know the difference between when you are working with producer, musician, producers, and you're working with a band, someone who works with a band all the time. See, a lot of producers don't work with bands mm -hmm. anymore. They used to many years ago, but they don't work with bands anymore. They're just, they're just producing music now. But you, unlike them, you're actively performing, out doing the whole thing with the band, so you bring a whole other perspective to producing, and it's all fresh. It's all alive. It's it's aggressive yeah, and energetic. That's music. and energetic, and that's what I wanted. You know, I, I wanted this album, the Year Save Thirty album. I wanted to, it to have that type of uh, uh, energy. Yeah. That uh, you know, uh, uh, like a song like Criticize. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do it harder because I would have, and I had the opportunity to be involved with some things that I thirty years ago I didn't have the, yeah. the opportunity yeah. to, to do. You know, so I'm putting stuff in records, the different twists that we're taking on. The record, you and I, we agree on it. Uh, we're putting different twists in it that maybe I would have. That's the way yeah, I would have did it ago, yeah. thirty years ago. Okay, mm -hmm. but now since I've, I've look, guys, I really don't know what I want to be when I grow up yet. Okay, <laughs> I really don't get that. But when I do grow up, <laughs> you know, uh, I, this album is more mature album, yeah, and it's yeah. and it's it, it's a grown up hearsay. Yeah. And that's what criticize is. Criticize is a grown up criticize now. Yeah, so that's 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 the most intriguing point to me. And hopefully that my fans will, you know, get this and, and enjoy it and uh, as well as we I definitely enjoy it. Yeah, I'm putting it together for you. Yeah, so yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Funding. So yeah, we're slightly more aggressive vocal. Uh, that's what that's what I went for. And just another couple of things to add with the vocal. There's a delay on there which we've added, which again is the parallel delay which is running separate. Us to talk about is this song the only one you sing? Makes you look better when you put things down. So what we've got on this channel is an amp simulator for a little bit of distortion with Alex's voice, uh, a, a, an oscillating echo, a 1960s echo on it as well. And that whole reason was because everything Alex has sang for 30 years has been a statement. He sings statements, that's what he sings. Everything means things, everything has a meaning or a, or a subject matter. So it was almost like a megaphone effect. It was all I wanted him to stand there and give the criticise because somebody said in an interview, which was great, it's criticised is so relevant lyrically now with all the how much fake things are going on and, and social media and all that. So it's as relevant vocally, lyrically today as it was 30 years ago. So. I was kind of wanted him to be statesman-like on the record. That's because that's what he is. So he's making statements to people, to the world. So I wanted that feeling from from the effect, which is why we've gone for this distorted, delayed kind of feel. Talk about 
it just... Is this song the only one you sing? Very, very subtle, but it's there. Makes you look better when you put things down. Without... Value your opinion. That's with it. And there's one, Don't other, there's one other little trick that people use. Oh, just quickly, the delay, quickly tell you about that. The delay is not a rhythmically set delay to any time signature. It's a washy delay because I wanted it to to be different from where the song was going rhythmically. I wanted it to weave in and out of the song. So it almost had its own life, which obviously Alex does as a vocalist. He's front and center, the band is secondary. So I wanted him to just weave into the band with the delay, just wash over it. So there's no rhythm. It's not, a, you know, in any kind of tempo. It's just 350 milliseconds, which is a good echo sound if you need it to be that. And then obviously I've got the BT um, echo set to the 19, 61 there, which you can see, 1964, but minimal. He doesn't need anything on his voice to make it sound better. It's just to enhance things that we talked about before. You, you, know, something, you know, something else that I wanted to share with, that's so important and to uh, a lot of vocalists, you know, when they come in and to do this, uh, to, to do these different things, a lot of times we don't know our thing that we we're so used to somebody telling us what to do. See, I've been in this business so long, and I've been around this stuff so much. For example, now back in the day when I was recording all the records and all the great records and stuff I did, I loved working with Jimmy and Terry, and they're excellent songwriters. And at the same time, my voice was mixed inside of their music. It almost like they were selling their production and my voice was secondary. It wasn't my voice but wasn't first. Fortunately enough, fortunately enough for me that my voice was so powerful until you you can't you can't can't hide it. You can can't you? hide me. Because I don't you, you you can't do it. And then if I even even suspect that you're trying to hide me then it's gonna get more powerful. Okay. <laughs> but you know, and I have that going for me. But the amazing thing about it is that I think that I'm much more, I'm enjoying this much more because I don't have to, I don't have to even question anything about Alex. Alex has, he studied my voice for so long, which is like three years now, mm -hmm. and for so long, and I just, you know, I it's such an honor for me to come in this studio and be able to work with someone who has my back, who's got the technical side all down pat, and that's what it is, you know. And uh, it's, that's a really great thing to have. We both have an agreement, don't we, that we don't let anything go out unless both of us are 100% totally happy with it. With and the thing is done. that I don't do anything special to get prepared for this. I, you know, and to be honest with you, I'm not going to, I'm a, not a religious man, I'm a spiritual man. And everything I do in reference to my gift is all because of my God, who I believe in, and I, 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 I say it very openly, and I do praise God each and every day for allowing me to sing in this, these songs. 30 years later, I'm still singing in the same key, still singing the songs. We haven't dropped the keys. We're still singing the same thing. I didn't say I was hitting all the notes now all the time, okay? Sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I don't get it right. But to be, that's, that's a blessing to me. So... Uh, uh, to be able to still do this and, and to come in uh, it, it, because when you get older and you're more mature artist that's one of the things that goes away your, your power, your strength you can tell the difference in a young, say a young Marvin Gaye and an older Marvin Gaye you know the sound, you're a young Gladys Knight and an older Gladys Knight, you, you know the sound if you know it, you hear it and because everything, when you're younger it's so easy, it's so automatic, you don't even think about it. You never thought, but I never thought that I would, like I have a note on Saturday Love I did with Sherelle. Mm -hmm. I never thought that I would never be able to hit that note. Mm -hmm. I got someone covering for me on stage with that note. I can hit the note, but I can't hold it anymore. So I can hit it, but I can't hold it. And uh, that's the one you still on my mind. Mm -hmm. And people want to sing. They sing right along yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah, so when I don't yeah, go there, they, go oh, to they look at me like, <laughs> wait a minute, what's going on with him? <laughs> you know. Where's my note, Mr. O'Neill? Yeah, where's my where's note, my Mr. Mr. O'Neill? You know, so it's like that. But, uh, yeah, this is a great, great thing. And I'm I'm just enjoying uh, uh, really. And, and another thing, you got to keep recording as an artist. 
I don't care how old, I don't care how long you've been, you don't ever give up the studio. I have so many tracks that people have never heard before because I keep recording, and that's what you do. Because when you stop recording, you're not even in the game anymore. The rest of it, sure, we're going to do good on stage and do the things that it takes to keep the lights on, to keep the mortgage paid, take care of business, take care of family. We're going to do those things. But when you stop recording, you're not in the game. You're not even on the bench. So keep recording, guys. Keep recording. Okay, well, that's it. Thanks for joining me and Mr. O'Neill at the Beauty Suite Studios in Manchester. We hope you've enjoyed it and found a little bit of this informative. Make sure you check out Hearsay 30, which is out now. And the great thing about it is that he called me Mr. O'Neill. I'm Mr. O'Neill. Wow, I've been waiting a long time to be Mr. O'Neill. <laughs>